You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 11, 2022, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, nasal dysfunction. Our presenters are, yours truly, Dr. Jay Portnoy and R.T. Pandya. Um, We're faculty members in the section of Allergy Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, We thought we would start with rhinitis. After all, what characterizes allergy more than nasal allergies, runny nose, hay fever? We can call it all kinds of things, but this is really the thing that everybody thinks of when they think of allergies is runny noses. So we're going to start with that. We want to try to make this as um, interactive as possible. So Dr. Pandy and I are going to carry on a conversation, but Anybody else who's in the group, please feel free to jo- to log in or to chime in because we need to have inter- interaction and input from everybody who's involved. Um, these are my disclosures. I'm a speaker for Thermo Fisher and a consultant for Immune and Teva. I also wanted to point out that some of the thoughts in this presentation are mine and are not those of the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters. So if you're hoping to get an official practice parameter discussion, forget it. These are my opinions, and I, hopefully Dr. Pena agrees with them, and I'll indicate where which is which. Um, Also note, I treat kids, mostly children. Many drugs are not approved under a certain age, so many references to off-label use of drugs, I don't know why it's skipping forward, uh, will occur during this presentation. It's just going to happen. And I will say that that Dr. Portnoy was one of the authors for the rhinitis practice parameters. So although many of the opinions that are in this presentation are his, they are also reflective of a lot of the practice parameters as well, as you've authored multiple practice parameters for rhinitis. Okay, thank you. So I I thought we'd start with a case presentation because that's how we like to start. A young mother brings her four-year-old in because he has constant nasal symptoms. She wants to know what allergies are causing them because, of course, allergies are the cause. When you ask about the child's symptoms, she tells you that he takes an allergy liquid once a day. She doesn't recall which one, and she tried a nasal spray, but he wouldn't use it. Now, you again ask about his symptoms, such as sneezing. She turns to the child and asks if he sneezes. He stares blankly back at her. Uh, What can you say about this interaction and the nasal dysfunction? How do you view this type of thing, Dr. Pena? Yeah, so great for kind of setting that up. And I think that a lot of the features that you have in here are pretty reflective of what happens during the clinic visit. Um, Oftentimes parents, you know, they know that a medication either either over the counter or um, via prescription will be given to the patient. They may not know which one. Um, And then some of the symptoms they may know about, other ones, as you have in the last sentence there, they may not know about. But I think um, this kind of comprehensively, like, um, correctly identifies how our clinic visits go. I will say that I know a couple of our slides that are coming in later kind of talk about the different types of rhinitis. Um, But I will say, especially for the incoming first years, one of the important things that you can do, and one of the more important things I also tell the residents and students who rotate through our um, clerkship is having a differential for rhinitis can be helpful. Perhaps it may not be, it may not change a lot of treatment if you are evaluating irritant rhinitis versus allergic rhinitis, but depending on the age of the patient, depending on the situation, the medication list, it may be pertinent to have a differential on what could be going on because that can help navigate some of the things you may recommend to the family. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that in just, a minute. I guess I would point out that you asked about the symptoms and they told you what medicine the child takes. Uh, parents focus on medicines. They don't focus on what's going on with the patient. So you have to keep asking over and over, does he sneeze? Does he have a runny nose? And they're puzzled by that because they just want to tell you about the medicines. Uh, parents are focused on drugs, not on symptoms. You have to focus them on symptoms because you need that information. Most of the time they won't be able to answer you because they really haven't been observant. They don't know what the symptoms are. Now, I mentioned the practice parameter. Here it is. Um, 
One interesting feature about it is that there are 37 recommendations. We're going to go through all 37 of these one by one. No, we're not. <laughs> Never mind. Everybody relax. We're not going to go through all of these recommendations. Instead, I want to point out that five of them relate to diagnosis and 32 relate to treatment. <laughs> In other words, even we, I mentioned that the parents focus on the drugs and they won't tell you what the symptoms are. Allergists do the same thing. Even on the practice parameters, they focus on the treatment and very little on knowing what you're treating. And if you don't know what you're treating, it's not likely you're going to get the right treatment. So I would try to, I would like to suggest that we try to at least focus a little bit more on knowing what we're treating before we come up with a treatment. I don't know why it goes forward, but it just does. Anyway, I'd like to start by defining rhinitis. Uh, it literally means inflammation of the nose. Anything itis means inflammation of that thing. The problem I have is that not all rhinitis involves inflammation. Um, there's a lot of nasal dysfunction that doesn't have inflammation, so this is a terrible name. I, I suggest alternative names like dis nasal dysfunction syndrome, NDS. We should start calling it that. Another option is the syndrome of nasal ill function or SNF. That was my attempt to be cute. Um, the thing is that there's no ICD-9 code for SNF or for nasal dysfunction, so you're going to have to code it as rhinitis, even if technically that's not what the patient has. But the, the reason I think nasal dysfunction is the right thing to call it is if the patient has bothersome nasal symptoms, then by definition, they have nasal dysfunction. Our job is to figure out what to do about it, right? Can we start a, a movement now to change the name of this thing, call it nasal <laughs> dysfunction? What does the nose do? do anyway. Could you, could you briefly describe the, nas the function of the nose besides wearing glasses? Is this for me, Dr. Portnoy? Yeah, you or anybody. What, what, why do we have a nose? So our nasal passageways are an important um, part of our body. Yeah, oh, it I'm keeps sorry. going forward. Go ahead. Oh, okay. So an important part uh, of our body that is a, a passageway um, to our airways. Um, it humidifies the air, it um, filters out particles. Um, because we are allergist immunologists, I would be remiss if I didn't say it's an immune barrier as well. Um, and then of course, most importantly, um, it provides olfaction um, or the ability to smell. So those are some of the functions that our nasal passageways do provide. Exactly. It humidifies the air up to 100%, warms it up to body temperature, filters out all the junk, helps you smell things, is responsible for the reason you can hear me is because um, I have sinuses that resonate. And it's also a source of nitric oxide, which helps to stabilize the lower airways. If you can't breathe through your nose, your lower airways are less stable. So why do we need to make a diagnosis anyway? I mean, we've talked about making a diagnosis. You emphasize the need to separate out all these different kinds of rhinitis. Why do we need to know that? So firstly, we do need to delineate when a patient comes into the clinic what it is we're treating. So just to give it a name um, and you know, bill for our visits, of course. But then okay. part of delineating between the different types, which I think we'll see in the next slide, um, like I said, you know, at, at some juncture, if you're talking specifically about vasomotor irritant rhinitis versus allergic, it may not make a huge difference what your initial treatment recommendations are, but there are other etiologies that should at least be considered. Um, and so those are kind of some of the reasons that we need to make a diagnosis. Exactly. And another another thing that, um, you know, I think was recently added in our practice parameters or certainly present in the European practice parameters are uh, in addition to giving the name or giving a diagnosis, it's also giving a quantification. Are you having intermittent rhinitis symptoms persistent? And then what degree of the persistent symptoms are causing impairment? Are you having mild persistent, moderate, severe persistent? So that has recently also been kind of added more um, for uh, distinct, distinguishing the severity of your rhinitis as well. Yeah, I mean, it's give it a name, to get paid, to figure out what treatment will work. The effectiveness of a treatment depends on what you're treating. And 
Um, for example, allergy shots only work if you have allergies. So you need to know that. Medications that dry the nose only work if your nose is runny. Maybe that's why you ask what your symptoms are. And surgical interventions are needed if there's an anatomic cause for symptoms. So kind of knowing what you're treating is helpful. I don't know why the slideshow is moving forward like this, but there is a differential diagnosis, as you mentioned. The problem I have with this is that this is really large, confusing, and I don't know what to do with it. Um, so what I like to do is to connect the symptoms with the goal of identifying a treatment for each one. So nasal, aller nasal ri ri allergic rhinitis and non-allergic rhinitis, are they really different or are we just tribbling, quibbling over what the trigger is? They might be the same disease, just triggered by different things. And remember, medications don't care if the patient has allergies or not. They just treat the symptoms. So we don't care about allergies if we're just talking medications. And if I can add a couple of points about um, some of the, especially the tables that you have here. So yeah. Dr. Portnoy has a table from the most recent um, practice parameters for rhinitis. And if you guys can look under symptom table five, kind of midway, chronic cough has been added. Um, this is not a symptom that was previously kind of recognized or um, I shouldn't say recognized, but well delineated in our practice parameters, but this certainly has been added. So that's something that um, we do now, you know, consider evaluate in the treatment of rhinitis. And the other thing, especially, you know, when you're, uh, especially as a first year, you're kind of learning how to evaluate these patients is, um, you know, the top uh, row here that says symptom allergic rhinitis, non-allergic, um, uh, respiratory infections, uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, knowing especially how to distinguish chronic rhinosinusitis with, with and without nasal polyps. So knowing our four cardinal symptoms of sinusitis, which is anosmia, hyposmia, facial pain or pressure as identified in the chart here, uh, refractory nasal congestion and mucopurulent discharge. Because as Dr. Portnoy mentioned, that treatment may differ if you have um, true sinus disease versus rhinitis alone. So that's one mm -hmm. of the other points that I wanted to make. I, I suppose, I'm not sure that the treatment actually differs or if we're just spending a lot of time coming up with different names of things. And I think that there's a lot of trying to just come up with names um, yeah, and that's certainly a, a, a perspective to take into consideration. But if you do yeah. have a refractory polyposis, you know, you may need ENT evaluation as well. Maybe and then so. one of the other, I'm but, sorry. But I, I would just, I mean, I, I just guess my point is try to keep it simple. If you can yeah. divide it up into a million different things and that then it becomes so complicated, it's hard to figure out what you're doing. I think it's better to kind of simplify things a little bit, try to put it together and come up with a general thing. For example, if you have a diagnosis, there's so much emphasis placed on diagnosing allergies. Well, you can treat things that have allergies with allergy interventions, allergy shots, environmental control. That's the only reason you want to know if they have allergies. Otherwise, why do you care? The medicines don't care and there's no other thing you're going to do with the allergy diagnosis. The same thing with medicines. All of these things can be treated medically. You can separate them out into separate things, allergic, non-allergic, irritant, colds, polyps. It doesn't matter. You're going to give them medicine to treat it. You're not doing anything different depending on all of these different diagnoses. And then if you need an operation, yes, of course, polyps, deviated septum. It's amazing how few people actually look in a nose to see that. Um, there's foreign bodies, tumor, all of that stuff. The bottom line is most of this is really rare. You can look in the nose, see something isn't right, and then that tips you off that maybe they need an operation and an ENT evaluation. Um, but, but separating all of these things out, personally, I don't find it to be that helpful, but that's just me. Yeah, and I I I think also oh there you had it up. And the some things never, some things nothing works. Yeah, <laughs> and you so can try all those. You're going to try stuff anyway. Not so especially not if you work. have atrophic rhinitis, you know your your therapies like nasal corticosteroids, antihistamines, those really don't work for that particular diagnosis. For right. that one, you need nasal lubrication, consideration of antibiotics. Um, and then some of those other um, conditions that you identified here, you know, they do need further kind of workup via yeah, CT scan. But, but the, bottom, the bottom line is the way you diagnose is it by you try, you try to treat it and it doesn't get better. Then you know nothing works and that's how you diagnose it. So that's it. 
Um, the bottom line is the practice guidelines have five diagnosis recommendations. The first one they recommend is a complete history and physical. Diagnosis of nasal dysfunction is usually made purely on the history. I don't even find the physical to be that helpful, but just asking questions, which the parents don't understand why you're asking all these questions. In fact, that's the most important thing. Also, it recommends reviewing current medicines to see if the, there's drug-induced rhinitis, rhinitis medicamentosa. I find that to be really unhelpful. It's pretty uncommon. Occasionally, it occurs, and there's some controversy of whether that even exists. I think the more important reason to ask about medicines is to see what they've tried and whether it helped, because if they tried something and it didn't help, no point in trying it again unless it wasn't given effectively. And then you want to use a validated instrument. That's something we nobody does, but I think we should probably consider doing to help monitor disease. Do you, any thoughts about that, Dr. Panja? Actually, I think other institutions do frequently use the validated instruments, especially the RCAT, which we'll talk about a little bit later, rhinitis control assessment tool. That's one that's frequently used, like you mentioned, at the initial visit, as well as once the patient is on medications, potential immunotherapy to monitor the severity of their disease over time. So um, I think our particular institution doesn't use it, but it's certainly um, other institutions do use these questionnaires. And then there's different ones that we'll talk about, ones that are lengthy and take a lot of time to fill out versus the efficient ones like the TNSS or the RCAT, which are able to yeah, be done so quickly. Don't, don't use the complicated ones. Just forget <laughs> yeah. them. Um, history gives you subjective information, um, like symptoms. So what, what are the four eye symptoms and the four nose symptoms? Most people can't list them. And this computer is just moving forward and I don't control it. It's got a mind of its own. Um, basically, it's so frustrating. With the eyes, you've got itchy, watery, redness, and swelling, chemosis. Um, nose, it's stuffy, runny, sneezy, itchy. That's easy. Those are the only symptoms noses and eyes can have. So if you ask about those symptoms, the parents are probably not going to be able to answer because they don't know if the kid's got a stuffy nose or a runny nose. They haven't paid attention. They haven't. They don't know if the eyes are watery or itchy or if they're swelling because they just don't look. It's it's just like that. In terms of the pattern, uh, it's either seasonal or there's specific things that trigger it, but that's it. Uh, in terms of respiratory infections, which is the most common trigger, comes in episodes, peaks at age four to five. I wish it wouldn't do that. And persistent without variation over time, that suggests that it's an anatomical cause. So just something to, to consider. Um, thoughts about this, Dr. Pena? No, I think, well, um, this is a great list to kind of start with, especially like when you're initially evaluating patients. Remember in our pediatric population that rhinitis can be a significant um, cause of children to have disturbed sleep. They can miss school due to the, their de the degree of their rhinitis symptoms. And so, um, you know, also evaluating in addition to these symptoms, how much are their symptoms kind of impairing their day to day may affect, you know, how you approach treatment with them, but just also knowing that those disturbances can happen both in the adult, but also in the pediatric population. For adults, it would be missed days of work um, as well. I, I usually find it helpful to just ask, is his nose so stuffy that it's hard to sleep at night? <clears throat> if it is, I use, I prescribe something different than if it's just a little bit stuffy, but not, but he can still sleep. And under Makes the temporal pattern, when you man mention anatomic or other causes, of course, adenoid hypertrophy is a common cause in the adult, uh, excuse me, in the uh, pediatric population um, to kind of think about as well if you're having rhinitis symptoms, especially like you mentioned, refractory to therapy. And if they're persistent without any variation, it's certainly something to think about as well. So with this history I was giving, you get a, you try to get a more useful history. Uh, the mother says that the nose runs all the time. It's also stuffy, but she's more concerned about runny nose than stuffy nose. Uh, if it's itchy, you ask if he rubs his nose. The mother thinks for a while and then nods yes, which means maybe. Uh, he sneezes occasionally. Most kids sneeze occasionally. Um, does he have eye symptoms? The mother stares at him and then says that his eyes occasionally puffy and watery, but not bad. You could seek more details. 
I don't find it very helpful to get more details, but, you know, in introductory allergy com lectures and conferences, they go through zillions of details. I just don't find it to be that helpful, but you can ask more details if you want to. People get impatient if you ask too many questions. Okay. So I, I do ask about a temporal pattern. Uh, is there a season when the nose gets worse? I ask that. Mother thinks about it, says spring and fall. But he has it all the time. That's usually the case. Any obvious triggers? He's worse when he's outdoors and with weather changes. Doesn't the weather always change? I, that's just, they just always say that. I'm not quite sure what that means. And do the symptoms come in episodes or are they persistent? Um, she says they come in episodes, sometimes lasting a few weeks. What does this tell you about this four-year-old's nasal symptoms? Any thoughts? Oops, I can't hear you. Sorry, is this for me, Dr. Portnoy, or is this for everybody? And for anybody who wants to answer, what do you think? So if they're coming in episodes and if they're lasting several weeks, I don't know that, I mean, I think you still have to consider both, you know, whether they're having colds that are causing symptoms, especially he's four years old. If he's in school, that can certainly be a, you know, etiology, but also, if they're occurring in a temp like a temporal pattern with these episodes, like spring and fall, and then lasting for weeks or months, you still have to do, you know consider whether allergies could be causing the symptoms. When we think of irritant rhinitis, you were mentioning changes of seasons. Really, at that for that particular diagnosis, any change of season. So whether that be fall to winter, spring to fall, all of those can be triggers of of their symptoms as well. Contrasting yeah. with allergic rhinitis. Also, infections are more common in the spring and in the fall. So spring and fall doesn't mean allergy. It just means spring and fall. It doesn't really tell you if it's an allergy or if it's the colds because they both have the same pattern. Um, this is the RCAT. Have you used the RCAT, Dr. Pena? I absolutely have. This is a very easy tool. It's similar to our asthma control test where you can give this to patients actually before the clinic visit and have them fill it out. Um, I think it's assessed, oh yeah, it says there uh, out of a score of 21 and it assesses the severity of their rhinitis. It's, it's very easy for parents to fill out, very easy to document as well in the clinic. So um, I'd say that of the different nasal scores that are out there, just personal opinion again this one is one of the most user-friendly ones um, to use it's also pretty reliable uh, the minimally important difference is three points it's pretty easy and comprehensive patients can fill it out and they don't mind filling it out because it's not too long that's a big deal like I, I can't stand the quality of life questionnaires with 23 questions I, I just I stopped answering it after the first 10 it's too long Right, yeah. Other information, like I know it's just going to move forward, so here's what I put. Um, what about family history? I've, I've never found this to be very helpful. We have to document it. We're supposed to ask about it. I don't use it for anything. I, I just don't find it useful. It's not going to change my treatment. Um, in terms of environment, unless you're really concerned, I don't find this helps to be very detailed. Most people don't know much about their environment. They're very non-observant. And they get tired if you keep asking too many questions. So I basically ask, do, they, do you live in a house or apartment? In other words, do you have control over your environment? What kind of heating and cooling? You can't make them change this. So it's mostly just for information. It's not like get rid of your cooling and get, a, get some other kind of cooling. They're, they're not going to do that. You can ask about dogs, cats, and carpeting, and you can tell them to not sleep with the dog if they're allergic to it. They're going to pretty much do what they want to do. So, but I get this. This is what I ask. Is this what you ask? I do ask about this. I will say with fam um, with environmental history, there are, depending on the motivation of the family, there is sometimes some things that may be able to be done. I'm thinking about a couple of patients I've seen where they were heavy users of candles and essential oils. And um, I think they ultimately had a diagnosis of, you know, irritant rhinitis from myself. And they did do a trial of removing candles, essential oils, as well as heavy household cleaners from the home and did have pretty significant improvement of their nasal symptoms. I can also mm -hmm. think of one, uh, one or two instances where they uh, 
parents adopted a rodent, like a, a guinea pig into the home. And um, with your history, because as you mentioned, history is the most important part when evaluating patients with rhinitis. When I was talking about history, their pattern of symptoms kind of matched the guinea pig um, adoption into the family. And that family was highly motivated to improve the child's rhinitis symptoms and allergy testing was done, positive, interestingly, only to guinea pig, everything else was negative. And so I talked about options. The family was motivated to rehome the pet. Um, mm -hmm. And after about, I'd say three, four months, the child had significant improvement in the rhinitis symptoms, so much so that she no longer needed medications. So um, something to definitely think about when asking about environmental history. And then for family history, yeah, I, you know, in terms of, is it gonna affect what you do? Probably not. Sometimes families, you know, we do know that allergic disorders tend to cluster in families. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one situation all the time, but we just kind of know that that literature out there exists but those you are know some I'm, I'm adopted when people ask my family history i say i'm adopted and they usually sigh in relief because then they don't have to waste a lot of time asking me a bunch of family history questions that they're not going to use for anything i just don't find it to be very helpful mm -hmm. you can ask it if you want to um here's a physical exam again i don't usually find this to be very helpful. That's why telemedicine works so well when you can't even do a physical exam. Uh, there are things you can look for, and I know, Dr. Pena, you almost certainly look for all of these and probably a lot more. Uh, I look for a deviated septum because it actually is more common than you realize. Basically, nobody looks in the nose. Um, I look for swelling, clear or yellow drainage. It means there's active dysfunction as opposed to previous dysfunction. Thick and green stuff doesn't mean anything. Certainly doesn't mean sinusitis. A lot of doctors think that it means sinusitis. It doesn't. You know, so it can be misleading. Happens later in the course of a normal cold. It, it normally just turns thick and green. That's how colds resolve. Nasal polyps do happen in kids. They're rare. If you see one, you're supposed to check them for cystic fibrosis. The, the few patients I've seen polyps in, I have checked them for cystic fibrosis. None of them ever had it, but I check them anyway because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, if they get red eyes with chemosis, chemosis is interesting. It's just swollen conjunctiva. When the parents see the conjunctiva swelling, it scares them to death. Um, so that's something that they will mention or comment on. Other things like shiners and nasal creases, the kid might have it. Uh, they don't really affect your treatment. Uh, they are fun to talk about. Many parents think that you know what you're doing if you point it out. You know, oh, look at the nasal crease. They're impressed by that because you know what a nasal crease is. But but I don't think, I don't find that it changes my, my treatment. Just, I don't know. <clears throat> Not a big fan of physical exam. What What do you think? Yeah, I think in terms of like the Denny Morgan's lines, the creases, allergic shiners, those don't necessarily affect your treatment course. Sometimes, depending on the degree of polyposis, you know, you may need to have um, surgery to remove those or ENT referral. Um, but in terms of kind of some of these other symptoms that you mentioned, um, especially like the conjunctival symptoms, the allergic shiners, the cre you know, creases, that doesn't necessarily affect how you approach treatment for those yeah, individuals. But it scares parents to death when they see swollen eyes. <laughs> they, they just, there it is, there's a picture of chemosis. That's scary. Of course, that, that's actually conjunctivitis rather than allergic. It looks more bacterial. Chemosis is usually whiter less red and less angry looking, but it's just this baggy stuff hanging out of the eyes. I couldn't find a good picture of chemosis by itself. So in terms of making the diagnosis, the practice guidelines recommend doing allergy testing to confirm allergic rhinitis if the history is consistent with it. I think we pretty much always do allergy testing, whether the symptoms are consistent or not, because that's why parents come in to see us. Um, Interestingly enough, they prefer skin prick test, but there's no evidence supporting intradermal testing. Um, current parameter gives equal weight to skin and blood. Doesn't even talk about blood tests. It just gives equal weight and then ignores it completely. Does not even discuss interpretation of allergy tests, which is kind of um, subjective. You look at the skin test and there's a lot of big red angry things. You you think it's positive and it's not necessarily very quantitative, it's more subjective. So interpretation is a subjective art. 
Um, and they say don't do food testing. Food testing is often requested by parents and providers. Just don't do it. Food testing, food allergy doesn't cause rhinitis by itself. But there's usually food symptoms. So thoughts? Yeah. I About think allergy testing? Yeah, I think one question that comes up is, do I need a minimal age for allergy testing? Do I only develop um, aeroallergen sensitivity after a certain age? And I yeah. think, especially if we're talking about, you know, perennials at a young age, um, you don't have a, a minimal age necessarily that you need in order to do allergy testing. Um, exposure to the allergen, developing allergen-specific IgE can really happen at any age. Now, there's some things, obviously, you know, we take into consideration, like the development of nasal passageways over the over over ages or over time, and then the development of sinuses over time. But really, the bottom line is that in terms of allergy testing specifically, you don't have a minimal age that you need to perform it. It can be performed at any time. Yeah, and allergy fellows will probably know that, but patients don't, and for inferring doctors definitely don't. They always say, oh, we waited till he was four before we could do the test. That's nonsense. You can do an allergy test at any age, and it will accurately tell you if there is specific IgE antibody present at any age. You have to be born. We don't do intrauterine um, allergy testing, but anytime after birth, you can tell whether there's IgE or not. That's Testing can be done at any age. So why do you do an allergy test? What's the point? And this thing is going to go forward. So I'll just say it, it helps you make a diagnosis. Parents want to know, does he have an allergy? Helps with environmental control. If you don't have an allergy to cat, you don't have to avoid the cat. Helps you predict a seasonal pattern. They can plan their vacations during seasons when allergy symptoms are likely to be high or outdoor activities. And you have to do allergy testing if you're going to consider allergy shots because you have to know what they're allergic to. So these are my reasons for doing allergy testing. Do you have any other reasons? Um, yeah, I think if the patient had, this is pretty good in terms of um, why we do it. And then the other thing is, you know, if they have rhinitis, the families just want to know, even if they don't want to do allergy shots, it's another reason to do it. You know, as long as they have the symptoms, um, I guess that kind of fits along with number one, making a diagnosis. I guess I just want to point out that parents come in with the belief that you need to do allergy testing so you know which medicine to prescribe. And when I tell them that the medicines don't care if the patient has allergy or not, many of them are surprised. They think that each allergen has a specific treatment and it's not that way, but that's a very common belief. So I always ask them if they want allergy testing, whether I think they need it or not, I ask the patient if, or the parent if they want it. Uh, whether you think it is indicated or not, Testing is what they were sent for most of the time, and they expect to get a test. Not not always. Some of them don't expect a test or even want a test, but I always ask. If they have already had a blood test that was negative, I try to discourage a skin test to make sure something wasn't missed. We get a lot of those. Patients are sent in, oh, the blood test was negative. There must be a skin test. Something will show up. And I, I will do it if they really insist, if, especially if they disapprove of my suggestion to not do it. But I really don't find it to be helpful. Let's say this skin's positive and the allergy blood test is negative. Well, which one is the right one? You, you don't have a tire breaker. You, you still don't know any new information. What do you think? I think, you know, that certainly is an issue that comes up. And part of the reason that even may come up is because allergen-specific IgEs to things beyond aeroallergens, such as drugs, foods, may have variable levels of sensitivities and specificities. However, that's different for aeroallergens, which is ultimately why the rhinitis practice parameter doesn't heavily point towards one allergy testing methodology for aeroallergen testing. And so that's certainly something to, to think about. But yeah, I mean, you know, if your blood testing is negative, that's not necessarily an indication to do skin testing. Now, it is done sometimes based on parent preferences. And, you know, if, if the history is, if there's something convincing or you feel like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But apart from that, those are some other things to kind of think about why those things even come up um, 
questions even come up, I should say. Yeah, I usually think that you do a test if the results have a likelihood of changing or confirming the treatment decision. If right. the treatment's not going to change regardless of the test, don't do the test. Okay. okay, so the probability of rhinitis, if it's really low, uh, you can treat them with medications or surgery if that's appropriate. On the other hand, if they have a very high probability of allergic rhinitis, you can give them allergy shots or environmental control. Allergy tests may help in that situation, um, but the medications don't care if the patient has allergy. I'll say that several times. People just don't seem to get it. It doesn't matter if you have allergies or not. The medicines work the same. So is, should you do a skin or a blood? Which which one do you do usually, Dr. Pangeo? Oh, that's a great question. I think it all varies on the situation with the patient. Some patients have come in on antihistamines. They've driven from really far away such that you can't do skin prick testing. Um, so one approach that pre um, providers offer is we'll come back in for skin testing. But for me, in that instance, I would offer blood testing to that family because I know this information that we've talked about with um, you know, skin versus blood testing. In other situations, if you, know, you have enough body surface area to do a full aeroallergen panel and you don't have any other restrictions, such as being on antihistamines, certainly you can offer a skin test. Um, so I'd say that for mine, um, you know, I, it's, it's not so much, I, it's, it's dependent on the situation with the patient. What about you, usually, Dr. Portnoy? Usually helps to give the patient, ask the patient what they would prefer, which most allergists don't do, but you could. Um, let's go through the pros and cons. Prick skin test takes 20 to 30 minutes. You get the answer right away. Uh, it's a whole bunch of pricks on the back. Uh, they're not painful, but they itch a lot if they're positive, and some kids at least really don't like that. Uh, antihistamines, as you mentioned, may interfere, and if the patient has widespread skin disease or dermographia, you can't do skin testing. Other things to consider, it's only semi-quantitative. You get a yes or no answer. If you try to measure the wheel and flare size, keep in mind the coefficient of variance is between 20 and 40 percent, which means that you really have wasted your time measuring those things, even though we usually do measure them. Uh, and the other consideration, which we shouldn't take into account, but which always seems to be important, is that allergists get paid to do skin tests. This is, I think, in part why allergists tend to prefer skin tests over blood, because that's how they get paid. Otherwise, you can't get your money. Um, the pros for the blood test, it's one stick and you're done. Uh, some patients like that. Antihistamines do not interfere, and you can do it if there are skin disorders. Um, it does take a few days to get the test results. Um, it is consistent. Coefficient of variance for a blood test is about 5%. It's a little bit more reproducible. So a change in the skin in the blood test actually does seem to rec represent a, a real change. A uh, few things interfere with it, although omalizumab can interfere with a uh, blood test. Uh, it's more quantitative, can be converted into likelihood ratios and probabilities. Not sure how critical that is for allergies, for rhinitis. Most, al most allergists seem to prefer one over the other, but I would recommend that you ask the patient what they prefer. So anyway, um, let's, we got to talk about treatment. We've only got 15 minutes. We spent 45 on diagnosis and 15 on treatment. I think that's an appropriate distribution of effort. Um, there's basically three treatments. There's allergic treatments, physiologic or symptomatic treatments, and anatomic treatments. Allergic treatments involve environmental control and allergen immunotherapy. Oops. Um, physiologic or symptomatic treatments involves medications, and then surgery for anatomic dysfunction. This is really it. There's not much. It's not complicated. We tend to make things really complicated. They're not complicated. Let's talk about antihistamines. What do you think about antihistamines? So oh, these, these. Let me just show the. These are the the players. I don't. I wish this wouldn't go forward. Antihistamines, decongestants, steroids. These, these are these are the medicines. Steroids, leukotriene modifiers, chromalin, anticholinergics, biologics. Let's go through them. Um, uh, what do you think about antihistamines, Doctor? Pandya, when do you use them? 
Absolutely. Um, antihistamines can be a helpful treatment, um, both systemically as well as topically. Um, in terms of the oral agents, generally because of the um, undue side effects that come with first generation H1 blockers, we tend to utilize second generation H1 blockers. Um, and then um, with the other ones, such as azelastine, um, which can be used as a nasal spray, can use, be used as an eye drop, especially if you your patient, depending on the symptoms that they come in, if they have largely rhinorrhea or purely just conjunctival symptoms, you may consider more targeted therapy in those individuals. So yeah, certainly I use them and they can be very helpful um, for patients. Yeah, I agree. I think any... in you know, it's been promoted. Antihistamines work specifically for allergies. That's not true. Antihistamines block histamine for whatever, where, however you get the histamine. Histamine causes sneezing, itching, and runny nose. So if you have sneezing, itching, and runny nose, you can use an antihistamine to treat that. Uh, the ones that have anticholinergic effects are better at drying the nose, but all of them get rid of the sneezing and itching. Um, in terms of decongestants, do you ever prescribe a decongestant? Depending on the degree of rhinitis that they come in with initially, if they have such severe congestion and obstruction on exam that you don't even feel like their nasal spray will reach the areas that it needs to go, sometimes you need to co-treat with a topical decongestant, oxymetazoline specifically is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Oral decongestion, decongestants, excuse me, especially pseudoephedrine, you need to take into consideration the patient's age because some of those may not be, you know, appropriate for younger kiddos. But certainly I have used decongestants in my practice for, for patients. Yeah, I pretty much discourage patients from using oral decongestants. Pseudoephedrine requires a DEA number. It's, it's behind the counter. Um, it can be turned into crystal meth. There's a lot of hassles associated with pseudoephedrine. Phenylephrine is a placebo. It doesn't work, period. It just doesn't do anything. So there's no reason to prescribe an antihistamine with phenylephrine in it because it just doesn't do anything. Uh, Oxymetazoline is very effective as a nasal decongestant. There's some issues associated, which will get to, but for the common cold, nothing works like oxymetazoline. It's the drug of choice, wouldn't you say? And when yeah, I, tell I think we have a little bit of discussion about that coming up on a different slide, so we'll definitely talk about that. Absolutely. Uh, what about nasal, what about steroids, oral, nasal, or ocular? Do you ever use steroids? We will definitely talk about nasal corticosteroids on it on, um, I think, an upcoming slide, because there's definitely some points that we want to make on that. Um, I can't say that I use ocular steroids personally. I'm not sure if you ever have. Um, and then oral steroids, I personally have not needed to, but I know that other practitioners or providers have used them depending on the degree of symptoms that they come in with. Now, if they have sinusitis, steroids plus antibiotics may be, or let's say steroids may be especially pertinent to use in those individuals. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, what about you, Dr. Portnoy? Yeah, so nasal steroids are good to reduce in, in inflammation in the nose, so they are mild decongestants. By the way, nasal saline can be a decongestant, too. If you use uh, two saline packets instead of one, hypertonic saline is a decongestant. Uh, oral steroids for severe nasal allergies, nasal dysfunction, sometimes a short course of an oral steroid can help them get through the really peak of the allergy season. And I have occasionally used ocular steroids for short periods of time when patients have really bad conjunctivitis. It just works better than the antihistamine eye drops. Do you ever prescribe Montelukast for nasal dysfunction? Um, there is a lot of information we've received about Montelukast, especially with the new black box warning. I will take, I will say a couple of things about this. If you're looking specifically at the FDA label for this, Montelukast has allergic rhinitis listed as the FDA label. So, um, that doesn't mean that individuals don't use it for non-allergic rhinitis, but it may just be something testing wise, um, for the fellows to remember that that's what the FDA indication is. Um, and I, you certainly, can, I have used it in refractory rhinitis patients, um, but there is a lot of variability on whether providers use it at all for rhinitis or not. Do you think it actually works? 
It really depends on the situation. I mean, I think in terms of my personal perception, it may or, it may or may not do anything for the patients. If you have somebody who's allergic, say for instance, and they really don't want to go on immunotherapy, but they want to use it as a last ditch agent to try to improve their rhinitis symptoms, perhaps there could be some rule there. Um, but other providers, like I say, don't use it at all in their practice. Yeah. I never prescribe it. I've found that it's overprescribed. People will put a patient on it, tell them to take it, doesn't help, but they never stop it. They just tell them to keep taking it, even if it doesn't help. And if you're going to start a patient on a drug, at least find out if it works. And if it doesn't work, stop it. Don't make them take it forever. Uh, don't don't leave them as drug orphans. That's it's not an antihistamine. It's not an antihistamine. Most non-allergists think of leuco they think monoleucast is an antihistamine. They don't know the difference. It's very common. Um, I don't think we ever use chromalin anymore. Anticholinergics like epitropium are often mentioned to dry the nose, but they're not widely available. And uh, yeah, like azelastine and antihistamine um, nasal spray because that has anticholinergic effects. And then biologics like Zolir, um, um, omalizumab can be effective, but they're they're very expensive, so we don't usually do that. So these are some of the recommendations from the practice guidelines. They recommend don't select a leukotriene modifier. Montelocast is not an antihistamine, and most providers don't know that. For severe rhinitis, consider a short course of steroids, of oral steroids. We do it for asthma. Why not for nasal dysfunction? And um, offer an intranasal antihistamine as first treatment for patients with seasonal allergic rhinitis. It helps the sneezing, itching, and runny nose doesn't do much for congestion, though. That's where a nasal steroid or decongestant would work better. These are the first recommendations. What do you think about these, Dr. Pandya? Yeah, I'd say that's, you know, pretty on par with a lot of the things that we've talked about so far. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then for monotherapy of persistent rhinitis, you know, nasal steroid is pre preferred. What I think is interesting is that then they Next line is an antihistamine is preferred, so they really prefer both. Um, it works best, um, right? Uh, steroid is good for congestion, but not for runny nose. Um, so I usually recommend whatever treatment the patient thinks helps them the most. Um, for persistent congestion, unresponsive, you can add a nasal decongestant up to four weeks. That would be oxymetazoline. It could be your friend. And offer an intranasal steroid as first therapy for nasal uh, rhinitis, non-allergic rhinitis, and an antihistamine as non-allergic rhinitis. I usually offer the patients both. Let them decide what works best. They may also prefer a combination of the two with whatever works best for them. But basically, treatment of allergic and non-allergic rhinitis other than environmental control and allergy shots is pretty much the same treatment. What do you and think? When we talk about a combination, and I think this comes up on a little a little bit later, but when we talk about a combination of intranasal corticosteroid and intranasal antihistamine, remember there's two ways that you can do it. Firstly is by prescribing two separate nasal sprays, but we also do have a nasal spray that has both of those agents. Um, commercially, it's the trade name is called Dimista. Very difficult yeah. to get approved with insurances, but just know that it exists. Also, when talking about that combination of intranasal corticosteroid and um, decongestion oxymetazoline, in some other countries, a formulation of a combo has actually been formed um, and is prescribed to patients as well. And it's the symbacord of nasal sprays. <laughs> so what do you recommend if the symptom is a runny nose? What's the best treatment? Something to dry the nose up, right? Right. That so, would be what? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. What? Antihistamine? Right. Anticholinergic? Um, oral antihistamine that has anticholinergic effects in it. Um, some of them like cetirizine. Do you have any cholinergic uh, effects? Phenidine does not, so it might not be as effective for runny nose, even though it's a good antihistamine. And then if the symptom is a stuffy nose, I asked, is it hard to sleep at night? An intranasal steroid, nasal oxymetazoline, if you give it at bedtime along with the steroid. Um, but I don't recommend oral decongestants. If they're having a hard time sleeping at night, giving them pseudoephedrine isn't going to help. It's going to make it worse. What do you think? Yeah, I think that all kind of is, like I said, on par with everything. Oral decongestants really um, 
I'd say that in the adult population, sometimes they're used depending on the situation. I'd say I rarely, if ever, use them in the pediatric population. Um, and yeah, I'd say that the other treatments that we're talking about, antihistamines um, with or topical antihistamines like antihistamine nasal sprays can particularly be effective for rhinorrhea itself when a patient has that symptom. What about oxymetazoline, um, which is aphrin? Um, yeah. The recommendations are that you can use it short term for intermittent or episodic therapy. And if it's severe edema, it can help uh, deliver something into the nose five days of use. So it helps you get other agents in. Um, but um, and, and when you do prescribe afrin, oxymetazoline, make sure you tell them oxymetazoline because there's also phenylephrine nasal decongestant. Phenylephrine often comes as the brand name neosinephrine. It doesn't work. It's only got four hour duration of action. It's very ineffective, a lot more risk of side effects from it. So I always recommend the oxymetazoline. If you do prescribe it, prescribe the no drip formulation, the little pump as opposed to the squeeze bottle. Squeeze bottle is just harder to administer. The pump is much easier. Um, it's an alpha agonist. It's a decongestant, works fast, lasts up to 12 hours. When you use it with the nasal steroid, you can use it for six weeks during an allergy season safely. That's contrary, and I always warn my patients, when you see your doctor or if you go to an ENT, they will warn you that that's dangerous and you're gonna get it hopelessly addicted, and two sprays of it and, and you're addicted for life, that kind of stuff. It's, it's kind of fear mongering about oxymetazoline. It's not true. Um, what oxymetazoline, what happens is if you use it over a period of time, it becomes less effective. It, you develop tachyphylaxis, so it, it's less effective as a decongestant when used consistently over a period of time. Um, but if you use it with the nasal steroid, that doesn't happen. It continues to be effective. So it's perfectly safe to use oxymetazoline over long periods of time if you use it in combination with the nasal steroid. I think of it as the drug of choice for the common cold. Um, and again, uh, the no drip formulation is better than the squeeze bottle. Have you used oxymetazoline for your patients? Yeah, and I think one of the points I also want to uh, just reemphasize is this concept of tachyphylaxis or rhinitis medicamentosa, which is a rebound refractory nasal congestion. That has received a lot of attention. It may even come up on your your boards uh, or board review. Um, so that receives a lot of attention as a potential dangerous side effects with of oxymetazoline. But when you use this nasal spray in conjunction with nasal corticosteroid, that risk even using it for weeks, like four to six weeks, drops significantly, which is why the practice parameters were were modified to include this agent. Yeah, it can be your friend. I, I tend to prescribe it quite a bit. Here's a study that looked at it. If you, I'm not going to go through any details, but if you use a fluticasone with oxymetazoline, the circles, you tend to have persistent symptom improvement over six weeks. So it doesn't wear off over six weeks um, like it might if you didn't use it with fluticasone. So use it as a combination. And in fact, I think of rhinitis and asthma in the same way. Um, rhinitis, uh, asthma has, con has controller medicines, inhaled steroids. Rhinitis has intranasal steroids. Those are rhinitis controller medicines. There are reliever medicines for asthma, usually an inhaled bronchodilator. Uh, rhinitis also has an, in an intranasal decongestant. That's a reliever medicine. Again, we don't recommend salmeterol or oral albuterol tablets for asthma, and we shouldn't be recommending phenylephrine or oral decongestants for rhinitis. Uh, the combination medicines, there's fomoterol inhaled steroid, Simbacord and Dulera for asthma. Oxymetazoline intranasal steroid would be a comparable treatment for rhinitis, and it works just as well. It's not available in the United States as a combination, unfortunately, but it should be. And then for runny nose, if you want something that's purely an anticholinergic, we have these medicines. They're not as widely used for rhinitis as they are in asthma, but there they are. What do you think? If I can make a couple points about this slide. So um, one thing that may come up, especially clinically that comes up is which intranasal corticosteroid should I choose to use for my patient? Because there's so many different options out there. There's fluticasone furoate, there's mometasone, there's cyclosinide, beclomethasone. I think 
um, knowing what your different medications do and what um, types of sprays are available is important to remember. So the intranasal corticosteroids can be available through that the spray itself, the traditional spray we think of, but it's also available via a mist formulation. It can also be available, particularly beclomethazone as an inhaler. So it, it, mm. it kind of does this very strong puff inside the nose as opposed to a spray. So just know that there are some different methods of nasal sprays that you can use. And one last point I just wanted to make, if you have a patient that has undue side effects due to feeling the nasal spray too harshly, or the nasal spray smells a certain way, or even if they have a lot of uh, bleeding with certain nasal sprays, you can consider cyclesonide because this one doesn't contain benzyl alkyl alkalonium chloride or phenyl ethyl alcohol, which those excipients have been associated with those side effects. So just some things to think about um, with those. Yeah, nasal there's sprays. also a clonase sense of mist, which is a yep. gentler mist, a finer mist, so it doesn't seem to bother people as, as much. So I just wanted to conclude because um, we're out of time. Rhinitis or nasal dysfunction syndrome is a common condition. That's why we wanted to start with it in our allergy fellowship, because this is what you're going to run into. It's the canonical condition that allergists treat. Allergy tests identify one type of trigger, allergic triggers. You can treat them with environmental control and allergy shots. That's the only reason that you're doing allergy tests also for public relations because people want allergy testing done. Uh, most forms of rhinitis can be treated with medications. The drugs don't care if the patient has allergies. I've said that too many times now, but uh, it's hard to get that point across more strongly. For a runny, sneezy, itchy nose, use a nasal or oral, oral antihistamine. For a stuffy nose, use a nasal steroid, or if it's more severe, oxymetazoline in combination with the nasal steroid. I usually ask, is it hard to sleep at night? If it is, use oxymetazoline fluticasone at bedtime, and that can help them sleep at night. Uh, anatomic forms of nasal dysfunction may require surgical inter interventions. That's where our ENT colleagues come in. Since all of your patients get colds, don't be afraid to tell them that they have a cold. Um, most patients have never been told they have a cold. Uh, you, they, they get diagnosed with an ear infection or a sinus infection, some reason that's an excuse to give an antibiotic. Uh, most of these are caused by rhinovirus. Antibiotics don't help, so there's no point in doing that. Tell them they have a cold. Give them a cold plan before they get a cold. Tell them what to do if their nose gets congested. They're not caused by allergies, but patients frequently ask what allergies causing my child's colds. But a lot of referring doctors ask that too. Be prepared to answer this age-old question. Any final words do you have, Dr. Pandya? I don't think so. I think for our, we can open it up to any questions that anyone has. Yeah, and any of our fellows or people out in the in Kola land wanted to chime in or ask a question? I Dr. An Dr. Anderson? Yes, um, thank you for a really great lecture. I enjoyed the new format. Um, I wanted to get your commentary on um, the idea of, I know we said that skin prick testing and blood testing um, are considered equivalent, but I have heard of the idea of preferentially writing AIT prescriptions based off the skin prick testing, um, <clears throat> with the thought being that that the skin prick testing shows evidence of clinical reactivity as opposed to the blood testing just showing the presence of antibodies that aren't necessarily um, actively contributing to clinical reactivity. So I want to get your thoughts on that. What do you think? So, so I um, write AIT scripts based on either. I think if you're allergen specific IgE testing, AKA your blood testing has demonstrated sensitization. And if clinically the patient has symptoms, then you're inferring that the blood testing is causing clinical reactivity. Um, you know, typically we as allergists don't do these blood tests if they're not indicated for a particular condition. And so if they're indicated because the symptom profile matches, and if you demonstrate IgE specific antibodies, I personally don't think that I would do skin testing um, just based on the principle of what you described, Dr. Anderson. 
Yeah, I mean, part of the reason why we changed our blood testing panels so that they are exactly match our skin testing panels is so when the patient is tested, they're tested for exactly the same stuff. And that way, the allergy immunotherapy prescription can be based on either either one equivalently. I don't know of any evidence that one is a better uh, indicator for what allergen immunotherapy to put in an extract than, than the other one. I just don't know of any evidence for that. Because if you think about mechanistically why why one would think of that um, versus in other ways, you know, you have your allergen-specific IgE recognized by your, you know, IgE antibodies, which causes cross-linking on your mast cells, degranulation of your mast cells. So yes, you demonstrate that by wheel and flare on your skin prick testing, but by obtaining allergen-specific IgE, your assumption is that that's doing the same thing, is that the presence of that antibody is causing cross-linking on mast cells, basophils, release of mediators, and hence the symptoms that you're experiencing. But these are, this is my thought, and I believe Dr. Portnoy's thoughts as well. This is Mark. I had a question. Um, Hi, Mark. Portnoy. Hey, Go ahead. I was just wondering what the allergists think or what the consensus is of when you might reach for a dupixin for chronic rhinosinusitis. Is that only in the setting of nasal polyps or what? how do they think about that? I think you talked about Dolair, but I was wondering about dupilumab. Yeah, dupilumab does have good data for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. I do think there's a cutoff age um, for that. I can't remember if it's um, 12. Hey, right, or right now it's FDA approved for 18 and over for that. 18 and older, it's which is, I believe, the same as omalizumab, actually. Omalizumab is also um, 18 and older. So there are studies out there showing some benefit in chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps. But to be honest, I don't think personally, like, we use it a lot outside of, I, I specifically use it when there's presence of nasal polyposis. Um, and I think widely, you know, allergists do use it with nasal polyposis. Is that kind of what you were asking, Dr. Sirota? Yeah, I mean, just in the, because I, you know, in the, uh, I see a lot of patients for eczema and I use it a ton for eczema and it works amazing, but it seems like yeah. uptake is a lot slower for rhinosinusitis in isolation. And it's really only indicated, I guess, for nasal polyps. So I just kind of, yeah, so that, that makes sense. And when it was, I'm sorry. Yeah, both uh, omalizumab and both omalizumab and dupilumab are approved for chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. I've only had two patients who I've tried to get biologics approved. Um, both of them were referred to me by ENT because the patients clearly had polyps that had to be surgically removed multiple times, um, and they didn't want to have to bother prescribing the biologics because it's a hassle. They didn't want to bother with the hassle. They sent them to us figuring we can be the ones who hassle it. Um, it's a real hassle because our, our patients are under 18. It's not approved for that age. The health plans always deny it. It's a major fight. Um, it's iffy whether we'll even get it approved or not. So that's, but I mean, I'm willing to fight for it, but the ENTs usually send them to us because we're willing to fight for it and they don't want to bother. Yeah, that makes sense. The, the other thing I was just going to mention is with the nasal steroid discussion, um, I was talking in my talk about perioral dermatitis. I've definitely seen that where people are on like Flonase or the more liquidy steroids and it drips down around their nose and then they get the perioral dermatitis issue because um, steroids make that worse. So it's not just it's not just topical like creams. It's also like nasal steroids or even inhaled steroids, especially if they're using a mask. They'll get the steroids around their nose and mouth and cause that. So the one I really like is the cyclesonide, which I forget the brand name of it but it's like oh, not yes. a liquid. Yeah, it's a smaller molecule and it's not a liquid, so it stays in their in their nasal cavity where it belongs. Um, so it doesn't also, like down their throat and stuff. I would, I would say that patients with perioral dermatitis like you're describing, you might also think of mouse dermatitis because everybody's wearing masks and it can cause a big problem. So I always tell people to get the mask block, which over your nose and then you wear your mask on that. Protects your face. Yeah, I think I think they're kind of like almost the same condition. Like call it, people call it like mask knee, but when you put the steroids under occlusion, like you put the steroid in somewhere and then you put a mask over it, then you're occluding it, which for the skin is helps things penetrate and work, but in perioral derm it'll make it worse. So yeah, I totally agree. And Dr. Sirota, the cyclosinide, as you mentioned, um, also doesn't contain some of those excipients that we talked about, which could potentially, you know, contribute to that particular um, perioral dermatitis, or excuse me, the dermatitis I, around. 
I think it's just like more expensive, but it's like the Cadillac of nasal steroids, in my opinion. Like, I don't know, it just seems to like everyone loves it and it works the best and it has a lot of advantages. I think it's just expensive. It is. It's difficult to, but sometimes we can get it approved through insurance, just depending on the situation. All right. I think it's uh, 10 after. We should be calling it quits for this morning. Thank you all for uh, joining us with uh, Conferences Online Allergy. This is our new um, attempt at making an interactive discussion. Um, we certainly appreciate any feedback that you might provide to us on how we could modify or improve it. This was our first try, so we're not we're not experienced doing it this way, but hopefully we'll improve and uh, do a better job as we cover other topics. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Pandya. Thanks, Dr. Portnoy. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.